Hey, everybody. Um, I decided it was time to go live again. And um, I whew, I posted about this in Project 24 and I uh, wanted to make sure that uh, people there could send me some questions too. So um, here we go. First things first, I want to give a couple updates on the Ultimate Content Warrior Challenge. And I will be, um, I will be looking at uh, some of the scores and things uh, real quick here while we talk, just so that I can um, remember some of the things I've been thinking about. Uh, we've completed the judging for challenge number four and challenge number five is underway. Um, I know it might seem kind of early for us to have, uh, hey guys, for us to have um, started to cut people out. Um, so I want to give a little bit of update of what's going on here in the challenge. Um, first of all, we have identified so many opportunities for teaching. Um, there are some things that a lot of people are doing really well. Um, people inside Project 24 and a lot of other, you know, bloggers and YouTubers outside Project 24 who are doing just an awesome job of so many things. But there are a lot of other things we've realized, like, this wasn't really that hard. People just didn't know what needed to be included to do well. And I'm not just talking about how to do well in our challenge, in our judging system, but how to do well um, at getting ranked on Google, at getting your content to be the type of content people are really going to um, want to uh, want to read. And so uh, because of that, there's just a ton that we've learned. So a couple things that we've identified. Um, looking through some of the earlier challenges, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with the blogging stuff. Um, I've, I talked about in the last uh, live a little bit about the blog formatting and stuff and, and what we saw there. Um, when it came to the about page, this was really interesting. When it came to the about page, uh, whether or not someone was able to establish any EAT on their about page had an impact on the score and has a huge impact on the effectiveness of, hey guys, I love, I, I don't love seeing on you guys. Um, it, it has a big impact on the effectiveness of that about page. The about page builds rapport with people and it builds rapport um, with, well, with Google um, in, the, in the long run. There are a lot of things we can do with the about page. So if you're in any sort of an industry where EAT is a ranking factor, especially um, anything YMYL, which by the way is expanding into so many categories beyond your money and your life, um, you need to create authoritativeness around yourself that's applicable for your niche. Now, it needs to be the right kind that's applicable for your niche. That means that in most cases, it doesn't require an acronym after your name. It doesn't require special, um, special uh, uh, credentials of any kind. In most cases for us bloggers, it just requires showing that you have some level of experience. And so whatever experience you do have, you need to highlight it in a way that's going to build rapport without just going nuts on it, without making it, you know, be a list of resume items. Um, so, uh, you know, when it comes to um, other aspects, right, building rapport with people, um, that rapport needs to be applicable for the niche. There were a lot of niches where it was like somebody came on and said, well, here's my background in this niche. Well, fantastic, but why do I care? And so if a person reads that, they want to feel like, they got to know you in a way that's appropriate for the type of content. But the one thing a lot of bloggers didn't do that I think does more to build rapport than almost anything else is images. I understand the desire and the need for, for some people to remain um, anonymous, their faces to remain anonymous. And in some niches, it's actually really, really easy for people to use like an avatar. So I saw uh, several people in the gaming space used an avatar, they never even showed their face. It's just an avatar that exists that has been created for them within the gaming world. And they just use that as their about image. And it's totally applicable for, um, for some people. Um, you know, they, they use the model image or a stock image and, um, and it worked, right? And even in some cases, they like owned up to it. They said, hey, you know what? I choose to, I, I like to keep my face anonymous, but, um, but this, everything I'm writing about myself is actually me, but this is the persona that I use or whatever. And that actually works. Um, but the problem is that a lot of those pages miss the mark. Moving on to the, you know, the next challenge, um, the answer targets. Scoring the answer targets was tough. 
Um, we have pretty high expectations for answer targets because Google um, is pretty particular about what can and can't be um, a snippet, okay? And so the formatting um, of the answer target is very important. If you write it too long or too short, it's probably not even gonna ever have a chance of being used. And so we ended up grading that on kind of a pass fail system, which we didn't tell you ahead of time we were gonna do that, but neither does, neither does Google, unfortunately. So the scoring I think is kind of the, the minimal aspect of what you can take from this challenge. I think um, the more important thing to take from it is the learning. What were the things that we told you in the video would help? How well did you implement those things? What was the feedback that you can glean from the scores we gave you? And what can you take and learn from that? Let me talk a little bit about some of the YouTube things. Um, you know, there was a, there was, I got, a, I got a comment. Someone was pretty frustrated that they got a very low score for their thumbnail and title. And arguably their score maybe could have been a point or two higher. Um, and that's totally fine. But the thumbnail that they presented um, had some issues with what it looked like visibly. And it also had a major typo. There were only like five words and one of them was completely misspelled. Um, when you're entering a challenge, you wanna put forth your best work. And so when comparing that to everything else there, it, it just doesn't work. And when you combine that with a title that, I think in this case, the person felt like their title was, was good. Like it was interesting and exciting. But for the industry they were in, the title was pretty average at best. Um, and so for that industry, it just did not have a chance of standing out. So, um, so here's the thing, when it comes to the scoring, um, you know, if it hurt your feelings, I I'm sorry. <laughs> Every time we go put a, a number, anything like below five on anything, um, it's like stinging for us. And I'm like, I hope that this isn't discouraging to this person. I hope that it's a learning experience. Um, so anyway, um, that's, that's that, that's the way that the scoring works, but the lessons learned, I think are the key. Getting high scores on these challenges, other than the answer target, wasn't that hard. The answer target, I'll be honest, the highest score that I ended up giving out, that any of us ended up giving out to anyone was an eight. Nobody even got a 10 on that score. Uh, on that challenge. And I think maybe we just judged it a little too harshly because of the expectations we have of our own writers. But other than that, I mean, every challenge has had several people earn a full score. And when we looked at what they did, it wasn't that it was necessarily hard. It wasn't that they necessarily even had to put more time and effort into the challenge. The difference was there was a level of understanding of what was required to succeed in that element of blogging or YouTube. And because they understood it, they implemented it in a way that they got a 10. There are YouTube shorts that got 10s that were probably not any harder to create than people who, um, put, in, um, who, who put in the same amount of effort but got a three, all right? Okay, so um, this is a YouTube Live. I, um, I definitely wanna take questions here. I have some questions from Project 24, as well as questions coming in from you guys here on YouTube. So go ahead and keep the questions coming. I'd love to talk about the challenge. I'd love to talk about, um, you know, how this is gonna work going forward, if that's something that you wanna know about. Um, but um, I also just wanna answer whatever questions you have. Actually, let me talk a little bit about where the challenge is going from here, guys. Um, if this is something you're following along with, if you're out of the challenge at this point, which we have cut a lot of people out, um, then anyway, if you're out of the challenge at this point, it's very important that for your benefit, you continue to follow along. What we're doing now is we've been asking permission from everybody who submits an entry, if we can share their site or not. And if they say yes, then we'll, we are actually including their entry in the, the scores. So if you go do challenge five, even though you're not in the challenge, once we post the scores for challenge five, you can go there and you can look at the people who did really well, look at the people who did less well, look at their entry and see how your work compares to theirs. Um, and that's going to help you immensely if that's something you continue to do. Um, uh, as far as cuts, there are a lot of questions here. Will there be cuts after these challenges? Um, going forward, there are going to be some cuts every time. 
after challenge four, I, we just finished the scores here not that long ago. Um, we actually cut a lot. The reason for that is that we're getting a lot more in depth. The challenges are going to start getting more, um, more involved. Um, the challenges are going to require content creators to be able to do maybe more than just the, the main skill they came with. And the judging for that, as well as the feedback we'll be providing, um, is, going to be, um, is going to be more involved. So the scoring is just going to take that much longer. And so I really, really, really wish we could keep everyone in the challenge the whole time. Um, literally every challenge comes in and everybody here, um, we don't, we're not outsourcing this to anybody else. So everybody here in the office is literally spending like a day and a half just judging your challenges. <laughs> we're getting behind on everything else. And so as this gets more involved, we're just having to cut back. Um, we are, as we judge these things, um, we're, we can hide the column to know who the entry is. There are some of you that we recognize um, from the YouTube channel, from Project 24. We don't know whose entry we're looking at when we judge it. And after the fact, we see that and we score, we rank them. And we are seeing on both tracks, a handful of people coming out ahead. Um, and they're just doing a fantastic job. And we look back and we're like, yep, they just nailed it over and over and over again. Um, and uh, Emma just pointed out, uh, you, Emma, you, um, I'm going to give you a shout out here. You got a 10 out of 10 on the last challenge. Emma's just killing it. And she's doing really well in both tracks. Um, but Emma is also just very engaged in what she's working on. And, um, and it's showing. And we don't know it's hers when we, when we score it, um, especially with these entries lately where it hasn't been. Like on YouTube, obviously, we can tell who it is. But on the blog stuff, when they submit an answer target on a prompt we gave them, we have no idea who wrote it. And still, um, a lot of you are just doing a really good job showing a high level of understanding of these important principles. Um, let's see here. Um, people asking, are we gonna do this again? Uh, what this channel will look like in the future, I'm not entirely sure. Um, it's been a huge, huge, huge time commitment for us. Um, and so uh, we'll just have to see what we're capable of doing in the future. Um, I would imagine if we did this again, we'd probably have twice as many entries. Um, and so, uh, we'll just have to see what we can do. <laughs> um, let me take a couple questions here. Um, this is a question about our creator studio. So we'll take, well, I'm happy to take questions about the UCW challenge as well as about anything else as well. Um, this one's about the creator studio. Uh, can we, can people hire the creator studio to help them scale? The creator studio as of right now is not being used to, write articles for people. You can't just hire us to write um, 10 or 20 articles or whatever. Um, it's something that we've looked at. It's something that we're considering, but um, I don't think we'll ever be doing that on the same scale as some of the other people who are doing the same um, and writing articles in a, based on you know income school style training and income school style articles. So even if we were to do some of that, um, it would be on a probably a scale. Um, what we are doing is building a lot of test websites. Um, we're building sites in various niches. Um, a, a couple of them we'll hang on to um, a little bit longer term. What we want is to always have niche websites outside of, you know, income school, right? And outside of, um, you know, we just want a few that we just keep very long term that we can try different things with. And same for YouTube channels. So Backfire is, is becoming both. It's becoming a, a blog and a YouTube channel. And it's one we're holding a little bit longer term so that we have aged sites that we can, when you have an aged site with a lot of traffic, you can try something and you can get a quick result to see how well it works. With new sites, it takes a long time to get any sort of result to test whether or not it worked. We also want medium term sites. We always wanna have some sites that are about a year old and we always wanna be starting new sites. So in the process here, we're gonna be building a lot of new sites and most of them will come up for sale. So if you're in a position where you do want to grow, but you want to grow by maybe buying another site, that's something absolutely that we will be doing. Um, here's one, they're in an outdoor niche uh, where one of the most heavily searched terms is where to find X near me or where to look for X in whatever state. Um, most of the existing results aren't that helpful. You think it's worthwhile to write an article for each U.S. state with in-depth information on some of the best locations to do this hobby? Um, concerned about limited search volume. This is a cool one. 
Jim and I were just looking at this the other day, not specific to outdoors or um, where to do this in X state or whatever. What we, but what we were looking at is articles that are able to rank for literally hundreds of searches. So imagine if you wrote an article that was like, all about the best outdoor activities to do in the state of Idaho that could potentially rank for where is the best place to go rock climbing, like outdoor or bouldering in Idaho. Where is the best place to go uh, whitewater rafting in Idaho? Um, I mean, just imagine by having a list of even just like 20 things on there, you could potentially rank for hundreds of different search terms. Um, so that, that's pretty cool. Um, I'll take a question here. If I interview three experts for challenge five, should I use the same questions? Um, you might, you might not. Um, sometimes it's valuable to interview a bunch of people, ask them all the same questions, and then kind of cherry pick the answers that you want to show in the blog post, but get kind of a consensus from them on what you want. Other times it's good to interview three different experts that all have slightly different expertise um, and ask them slightly different questions. And again, then just highlight you know, each interview in kind of that section of the article. So it really just depends on the approach you're taking to the article and the type, the different people that you're going to be interviewing. If they're all basically have the exact same expertise, I can see a lot of value in um, asking them all kind of the same questions to try to get uh, the overall consensus of what all the experts say, what they agree on and what they disagree on. So it kind of depends what you want to show. Here's another one from Project 24. Uh, with what seems like an increased focus on the quality of blog posts uh, in the Creator Studio produces, have we changed the amount of time we expect our creators to produce each type of blog post uh, and have those times increased? That's a great question because um, we used to talk about how we gave our writers 90 minutes and then maybe two hours to write a shorter response post. Um, and, I, and I do, um, sorry, I'm interrupting myself. I do see the comments as they come in, the questions as they come in, and I do really appreciate you guys. Um, you know, you guys share compliments and stuff and, um, it means a lot to me that, uh, you guys care, um, about just what we're doing and the effort we're putting into the work we're doing. Um, it's just awesome. Um, but back to this question, what are those times and have they increased? We're actually testing out a little bit different approach and depending on how well it works, it, it will probably impact the way we teach blogging going forward. Some we're, we're separating time from the length of the blog post. Um, sometimes we say, we tell the writer, we want a 1300 word blog post. So the length of about a response post or even a thousand word blog post. However, this one, there's this research we want you to do. You know, I want you to call these people. I want you to do this thing. Um, and sometimes it's maybe not that specific, but we just have an idea that this has the opportunity for some really good research if they'll just follow through with it. So instead of two hours, we give them three or even four. Um, sometimes we'll have them write a long blog post simply because it takes that many words to cover the topic, um, but it doesn't necessarily need to take more than four or six hours. Um, and so we're separating the two. So in general, we're usually giving them about two hours per thousand words. Um, so a thousand word blog post, about two hours. And that gives them, um, that includes, by the way, 30 minutes of just research, no writing. We expect them to, um, at very least, go watch YouTube videos and get more background on the subject other than just reading other people's blog posts. Okay. Um, but it usually also includes some sort of other form of small form of unique research that, um, that might include making some phone calls. It might include um, getting some data. Sometimes it might include pulling a certain audience and then coming back to that article a different day. Um, you know, sometimes a uh, 2000 word blog post, um, we're going to give them six hours, uh, depending on the type and amount of research we expect them to do. But we're also identifying that sometimes there's pillar content for a blog that should have great research, but realistically, it should only be 2000 words or even 1500 words because a lot of the research should be shown in more like table form or an infographic. And so we're just separating that out a little bit. And once we have a great way to teach that, um, you know, our blogging um, instruction within Project 24 will begin to reflect that. Um, 
But when somebody's just getting started, it's really good to have a very a much more rigid and structured format. So uh, we're still kind of working on how we're going to teach that. Um, I have a question here from Dea Rede, Rede, Rede De. Sorry if I butchered that, but I wanted to uh, give you a shout out. Should I write on Medium or my own website? Absolutely um, write on your own website. Um, Medium can be a fine place to get found. It can be a fine place if you want to kind of duplicate your content um, and link back to the original. But um, you want to own that content. You want to own where it is. You want to be able to put your links in it. Um, it having your own website is very important for internet marketers. Um, and so writing on other people's platforms only is not uh, something that I would recommend. There's another one from Project 24. I follow stuff for YouTube, published over 31 videos um, starting in September. I'm getting three impressions or less per day. All the titles are specific questions. How do I start getting impressions? Uh, I, have, I have a high like percentage when my videos do get shown. YouTube is another place where we're working really hard to improve the way that we teach and improve what we teach. Um, the YouTube 60 Steps in Project 24 are good and they're based on the experience that we've had on YouTube across several YouTube channels um, leading up to about a year ago when we created those, um, that course and those materials. In the last year, we have learned a ton of new stuff. And so we are actually right now working super hard um, to put out a whole new approach to YouTube. Now, it's not an approach where you, where you have to start from the beginning um, and you know, start over on your channel. It's, it's more of a teaching approach where you can come to it wherever you are. And so if you already have an existing channel with videos, it's just gonna teach you some, a whole new set of skills that's gonna help you do better on YouTube. So one of the things in answer to this question that we've learned is that um, if you're coming from a blogging background to YouTube, you have to forget basically everything that you know, especially when it comes to coming up with topics, when it comes to search analysis. With YouTube, we're finding that um, matching a search is actually not something that uh, matters that much, which seems crazy. Um, our theory before was you need, to be a, you need to be found in search to be able to start getting seen at all so that people will watch your video and YouTube will be able to push it out there. Um, and I do believe that to some extent that's helpful and true. However, um, making videos where the title is a question and it's specifically answering a specific question um, is a really blog style approach. It's a really SEO Google style approach and YouTube just isn't working the same way. There is search and people do find you that way. And we do wanna make videos that would appear in a search result for those topics, but we want the title of the video and the thumbnail of the video to be um, still more interest-based. Um, and we also wanna focus more on the things that we care about when we make videos. So when you make a video, instead of trying to figure out what, what an audience wants, instead, we make videos more about the things that we're most interested in within our niche. And by being more interested in the topic, the video is better. Um, and so anyway, there, there's a lot to unpack there and there's a lot to, to learn there. So, um, the YouTube course, we are working super hard to try to get it out by February one. I know we are always saying like, oh, we're working on that. It'll be out soon. The same thing with our info product course that is so close. Um, but there's some resources we need to finish for that one too. But that YouTube course, um, the goal is February one. And I'm saying that in part to, um, force myself to keep sticking with that. Okay. Um, Cora's asking, does that mean the content inversion or the source inversion is no longer a thing within YouTube? Um, I, I kind of think that, um, I, I don't think that uh, it's a principle that made a lot of sense and it's a principle that we had kind of seen before, but, um, I think that that mentality might be, um, I don't think it's hurting anyone, but I think it, um, by thinking that way and by taking a more search focused approach at the beginning, um, we might be holding ourselves back. So um, anyway, so that's something we're working on. We've learned a ton. Um, obviously, Nate's been experimenting like crazy um, with channel makers as well as on other um, channels he's kind of been working on and stuff. 
Uh, we've been testing stuff like crazy and we've just learned so much. Um, here's another one. Uh, let's see. It's taken forever to get to 100,000 subscribers. What kind of subscriber rate should I be aiming for? Or should I not even worry about this? So what kind of monthly subscriber rate? Um, I, I wouldn't um, set a number for yourself of how many subscribers you think you should get per month. In the early stages of the site it, or in a, of, a of a YouTube channel, it's, um, it's, it, it's, it can be very, very slow. Um, or it can go faster. Uh, and it's just hard to know what's going to work and what's not going to work. So I wouldn't hold yourself to anything. I mean, um, if we set a number, it, it's, it's, some people are going to feel like, oh, sweet, I'm soaring above that. And other people are going to feel behind. And the reality is it just really depends on the size of the audience. It depends on what the audience is like and how open they are to new ideas. If it's an industry where there's just like a couple big names and nobody cares about anybody else, it might be tough to, tougher to break in. You can, you absolutely can and should try. But, um, you know, it, it might just take a little bit longer for people to realize that there, there's a lot of value outside of those, those big names. Um, and so I, I wouldn't. I would worry about continuing just to make really good content. And um, I would focus on, in calls to action, getting people to like your videos. Um, I would focus on trying to encourage people to comment on your videos and to interact with those videos. Um, getting people to subscribe uh, who wouldn't like any of your other videos doesn't do any good. So in a video, having a call to action, hey, subscribe if you liked this video, it's like, cool. If they don't like your other videos because they're not quite the same, and they don't watch any of them, then YouTube's like, well, their subscribers don't watch most of their videos. And so that's, that's not great. And so if you do a video that's a little bit different than everything else and you get people to subscribe because of that video, those subscribers can in the long run actually do more damage to the growth of your channel because again, YouTube sees that, you know, um, a, 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 a smaller percentage of their subscribers watch their videos every time they go out than other channels. So their channel must not be as good. So it's better to get people to engage. And if you are going to have a call to action to subscribe, it should be right after you give someone just something awesome that, um, you know, you give them an awesome piece of information, a great piece of advice and say, hey, if you like that, make sure you subscribe because I, there's more where there's, that's coming from. Um, sometimes people will subscribe when you ask them to and they're probably, they may not be the type of person that comes back. Um, what do you think of Patreon to monetize a YouTube audience? Um, you know, I think it's fine if it's in the kind of industry where people expect um, that sort of a thing. Um, you may be in an industry where people are like, yeah, I really don't like ads on these videos, but I'm totally happy to give back to people that create this content for me. Patreon it might make a lot of sense. It's not, a, um, it's not an approach we've taken. Most of our channels have been commercial enough that people ex are perfectly happy and expect to see ads. And um, we can monetize them through affiliate links and other things. Um, sometimes I've gone so far as to say, if I don't have anything you're worth paying for and my videos aren't worth watching an ad for, what right do I have to ask you to donate money to me? Now, I do think that's a little too harsh. Um, and I do think there are a lot of uh, industries where, where people would really appreciate um, that. I, we're also seeing with YouTube that, you know, you can create content that people have to like be paid subscribers to you on YouTube to watch. We haven't experimented with that either. But um, there you go. See, Emma's like, I love Patreon. I use it. Um, it's not something. Uh, it's not something that we have tried, and I think that I've maybe been too harsh on that in the past. Um, that's kind of the the capitalist in me <laughs> is is saying like, yeah, if, I, if people aren't willing to pay me for stuff or watch an ad before they get to my video, then uh, I'm not providing enough value, and that's actually not necessarily the case. Um, if you're time poor. COVID, childcare, everything that's going on, which would you prioritize, new content or overhauling old content? Um, this is a great question that I think uh, really depends where you are. If you are in the first year of content creation, in, even if it's in a new, um, on a new platform. So if you've been blogging for a while, but it's your first year on YouTube, content creation all the way. Um, after a year, if you've written or created, made videos or whatever, um, a sizable amount of content, then I think there can be a lot of value in starting to split that time, maybe more 50-50. Um, on a blog, 
you know, if you reach a point on a blog where you've really covered, you've covered it, you know, and you're like, I don't, to grow, I don't know that I necessarily want to expand from, you know, Shih Tzus to all dogs. I want to stay a Shih Tzu blog. Great. So now it's time to battleship that content, go through the battleship method, um, figure out which, which um, topics you didn't win. And let's become just the authority on that. And you might not write that many more new blog posts unless you're just doing a total overhaul of an old one. On YouTube, the same thing kind of applies. Um, uh, on YouTube, it kind of applies as well. Um, but the difference is you can't just like edit an old video and put it back up. Um, so uh, you have to just create new content and then um, but you can still kind of battleship. We haven't really played with that a lot yet, but you could take a concept that you talked about a year or two, three years ago, and you could create a new video about it. And even you could even go so far as to put, um, a card or even links in the description from the old video saying, Hey, there's a new updated version of this. Make sure you go check it out because people will still find the old versions. Um, I, I got a super chat here from no man's planet. It says pay. You did say, um, so thank you for that. Um, it says need help though. So um, if you if you need help with something, uh, you go ahead and post your question here. I, I just didn't see a question there. Um, hey, this is a great question here. How to get affiliates for my new online course? So you've got a new course online. You want to get affiliates for it. There's some great plugins that can create those programs for you. But how do you get affiliates? This is where you know we as content creators need to do a great job of starting to work with each other. Um, this is a huge opportunity. A lot of content creators are never gonna make their own course and maybe should never make their own course. They should keep things pretty passive. But for digital products like a course, um, that can be a great affiliate program where if there's no like ongoing requirement, for example, an ebook or just a course that people get at one time, there's not really a lot of support involved. You can have a very enticing affiliate program. You could do a 50-50 share split. Um, with affiliates if they do a good job for you. Um, so this is where we need to be collaborating. It's time to find some other blogs in your niche that, you know, maybe aren't quite as direct of competitors. You know, you're not writing about all the same topics, but, um, you know, the, but you're in the same niche, right? Um, and it's time to reach out. It's time to um, find people that have podcasts and YouTube channels in your niche. And it's time to let them know Look, I created a product. I think it's awesome. I'd like to give it to you. And if it's something that you'd like to recommend, I'm also willing to share revenue with you. Um, we can set you up with an affiliate link. Um, that kind of outreach is what's needed today. There's not, we haven't identified a great network for that. Um, it might be something that we may be thinking about creating um, <laughs> because it doesn't exist today. And it needs to because content creators are creating info products, creating awesome courses and other content creators should be promoting them. Um, it's a great passive income stream for those other content creators and a great way for um, those who create the course to be able to, to spread the word on that. So there you go. Um, this one's from apparently my numero uno fan. So two questions here. Is it okay to spend more time perfecting each sentence in your blog or trying to use your blog to get you writing jobs as well? Um, oh, okay. So this is someone who's like, should I perfect every word? Cause I want, I want to get a writing job too. And I, I want to use it as a resume builder. Um, in that case, yeah, maybe it is worth the extra time because you're using your blog to basically show your skill as a writer. Well, in that case, yeah, you better do a really good job of writing for most people. I would say taking the time to perfect your exact wording every time is maybe not the best use of time. Let's get content out there. And the second is, is it possible to have a ton of writing styles in your blog as well as being SEO friendly? Not just a little style, a ton. Um, a lot of, the, the, the difficulty with um, having a lot of different writing styles all under the same author name that are very, very, very different writing styles um, is that it can look like different writers. That said, um, I can't, um, I, I, I don't know. I know that Google is capable, the algorithm is capable of recognizing that. But if that's something that you own, right? If it's something where my niche is writing and I'm talking and I'm using this as an example of my writing, 
um, and I'm using this to get jobs writing, then I, I wouldn't imagine that it would make that big of a difference. I think overall though, um, search engines are looking at individual pieces of content when they rank them. Um, they're looking at the overall site when it comes to comparing two pieces of equivalent content um, or even remotely close content. Um, and to be fair, um, sites that are already existing and bigger are probably getting indexed more frequently um, and therefore their content's gonna rank faster and therefore you also have to kind of knock them off, which means yours has to be a step above if you're a newer site. But in general, the search engines are looking at individual pieces of content and then they're referring back to the authoritativeness and the other factors on the site, like writing style, um, as a little bit more of a secondary approach. So uh, again, if that's something that's important for the purpose of your website, um, being able to show all your writing styles, then yes, do it. Um, but for most people, you wanna try to have consistent voice, okay? Um, <laughs> let's all start saying Nietzsche <laughs> instead of niche or niche. Or niche or niche or nicho. Um, okay, what do you, um, let's see. I got a lot of these. Um, the question about UCW, after round five, are we moving to a bracket format? Um, not yet, maybe not at all. I said bracket before in a previous YouTube live and we keep going back and forth on that because um, you guys are gonna get the insider tip here, right? Um, What's going to happen is after round five, the blogging track and the YouTube track are going to come together. Um, and the challenges are going to require the ultimate content warrior to be able to be an ultimate content warrior, not an ultimate blogger or an ultimate YouTuber, um, which this is good news for people like you, Emma, and some others on there who are doing both quite a bit. Um, but they're going to come together. And the problem with a bracket is if we do a bracket, and there's a YouTuber versus a blogger, and we put up a challenge that is more YouTuber centric, the blogger is gonna have no chance, right? And vice versa. And so we're a little bit hesitant on doing a bracket where two people go head to head until we maybe get close to the very end where we really are talking about the top people and we just need to do a bracket. So what will happen after challenge number five though, and I just posted this on the site, um, there's a little, kind of a um, update section on the challenges page where, um, where uh, after challenge, anyway, there's a segment there where I'm posting news. And in that segment, I talk about uh, right now on there, it says, um, I'm like losing my train of thought. I'm sorry, guys. Um, oh, we're gonna, after challenge number five, everybody that's made it after that, the scores get wiped clean. So there are a couple of people who've done a really good job up until now who are leading the pack by a few points, which, I mean, they just, they have earned it, absolutely. But um, at this point, instead of moving to a bracket, we're just gonna kind of wipe the slate and it will begin, um, it, was, it will be cumulative from here on out as well, but it's starting fresh. So if you're at the bottom of the, the winners up until now, and, but you're still in there, um, you're gonna get to, you're gonna still have a chance you're still going to be able to be competitive. Um, and for those that are leading at this point, in theory, you're probably going to also do really, really well going forward. And so it's not too much of a loss to you. Um, there you go. Um, mailing lists, um, time cost versus payoff of an email list. Um, I'm assuming you mean uh, email list, by the way, because uh, um, a mailing list like Actual mail is not something I would do as a blogger. I hate mail. Um, it's like always bills. I, there's almost never anything in the mail that I care about, except at Christmas time when I get cards from people. No, um, an email list. There is a lot of value in email lists. It's something that we need to get better about implementing and better about teaching. Um, we have some basics in Project 24 about email lists, just basically how to create them, and a couple of tips for sending out good drip campaigns but it's something that we do want to get a lot better about teaching. There is a lot of value in them, especially if you have a really high value info product or a really high value affiliate product, or you're going to create your own product, whether that's e-commerce or affiliate or anything like that, or whether that's e-commerce or an info product or something of your own to sell. Um, if you have something like that, that you're ever going to create, 
then as early as possible, I would start getting an email list. The issue is once you start an email list, you need to keep that list warm, which means you need to have something being dripped out to people, not too often, but often enough that you stay relevant to them. Um, otherwise, uh, it just doesn't, it doesn't have any value. When you do send something out two years from now because you finally launched your course, um, these people don't remember who you were. Um, let's see. Which one I'd rather see on a new blog in the first year? 50 posts that are on point and follow the recipe 100% or 100 posts that are 80% of the post recipe? That is a tough decision because the more um, lines in the water, right? Uh, the fishing analogy we always use. The more posts that you write, um, the more opportunities you have to determine which ones you're likely to win, which topics you can win. However, if, you, if you're not far enough on like creating a really helpful con piece of content, as well as you're not quite there on the topic, um, then, uh, then it doesn't do you any good, right? If you have a whole bunch of lines in the water that just have hooks on them, but no bait, you're still not going to catch any fish. And so um, they need to be far enough along. Your search analysis needs to be good enough that you're probably going to win a reasonable percentage of these. And the helpfulness of the article and, and um, having good answer targets and stuff in the blog post, um, those things need to be there. If the other writing and formatting isn't 100% there, but you got good answer targets and the blog posts are helpful and they're on good topics that probably have reasonable search volume, and that com competitive wise, you absolutely could win, then sure, I'm all for getting out more content because a year from now, you're gonna be able to tell, um, yeah, some of these topics I was never gonna win, but some of these, maybe I'm ranking number three and I can, I can move it up to number one. Or maybe I'm winning the snippet, but I'm a little bit nervous um, because the rest of the content's not that good and I really wanna solidify my place. So I'm gonna go and I'm gonna tweak that, okay? Uh, no Man's Planet says six months, 160, 1500 word posts, um, and at 800 organic. So I'm assuming that's 800 page views after writing 160 posts. Um, here's the thing that stands out to me is the six month thing. Okay, so if you, you've written a lot of content in a short period of time, and for that, like, congratulations. Um, that's very good. Um, if I've written a lot of content and it's aged, which this content isn't aged enough yet for a new site. But if it's aged and I still only have 800 organic page views, which I do think is a little bit low at this point, depending on how old well most of that content is, um, then I'm concerned. I'm concerned about two things. I'm concerned mostly about my search analysis. Have I picked topics that I can realistically win and that people are probably looking for? Now, there's not a tool out there that's going to really tell you how many people should be, should be coming to that article. Um, I know I recently made a YouTube video about the search volume numbers from uh, keyword research tools. They all disagree with each other. But even so, what we find is that, you know, articles often rank for anywhere from a few to literally hundreds of specific search terms. And so um, you can't know. So that's where you just have to use the gray matter between your ears. To, does it make sense that um, enough people would click on this topic? Um, if you're, if that is good and you've looked at the competition, you've actually done the Google search for each of those topics and you should be able to win. You've created better content and not just a little bit better and not just on par, but a step above and you've written good answer targets to be able to win snippets. Then at this point, I would say it's time to give it a little bit more time, um, because six months isn't long enough to know for sure how it's going to do. Let's see, um, are the number of Amazon links a ranking factor? What's a good ratio of links to other external and internal links? Do you suggest building recommended pages to consolidate affiliate links? We used to really, really recommend building like recommended gear pages or whatever to consolidate affiliate links. And I do like that. I like having a resource because it can be used very user friendly. Um, it can be super helpful when somebody's like, you know what, I really, I'm, I'm really liking the advice these guys are giving or this gal is giving, and I, I really kind of want to know what they recommend. And having that page, I do think is probably really helpful for converting some affiliate sales. Um, we used to also say, don't spam your site with affiliate links. In fact, 
link to your recommended gear pages and have the affiliate links there. So in your blog post, don't even put the affiliate link. We used to say that. I don't agree with that anymore. I do think it can be very harmful to the SEO as well as the user experience of a website to just be spammed full of affiliate links. Um, absolutely don't do that. Do we have a solid ratio? No. Um, I would say though, that if it feels natural, if the recommendations feel natural, it's fine. The, the number of links within a blog post are fine. Um, affiliate links to other external and internal links. I don't know that there's a great metric for that. In some blog posts, it's gonna make a ton of sense to link to other blog posts on your site. In some blog posts where you're citing a lot of data, it might make sense to link to external sources. Um, absolutely, you know, link to the experts, um, especially when it's like a expert topic and it, or there's statistics or whatever. Um, but like for each individual article, I wouldn't say, well, every article should have two external links as well as two internal links to other posts on your site and then no more than three affiliate links. There's not a metric like that. And I would even say that overall for a site, there's not, I don't think, I don't think any study could reasonably be done to prove that there's an ideal. Um, what I would do is do what feels natural. If it makes sense to do an external link to another blog post, put in an external link. Anywhere where it makes sense to do an internal link, do it, especially in your blog posts that get the most organic traffic. Go to those blog posts that are doing really well. Look in your analytics and see, look by page, which, are, which pages are driving the most traffic to your site. Go to those ones and create opportunities to link to other blog posts that are monetized. Um, and if it's a post that talks about a product, have a link to the product. Other things that we wanna, that we're trying now are, um, you know, maybe putting a list at the bottom of the blog post that says, hey, here's a list of the products I recommended in this post. It's one last opportunity to just say, these are the products I recommended above, they're here for your convenience. Um, if you're not doing that, or if it's a blog post that's not otherwise monetized, we're considering even putting a table at the bottom of your blog post that says, hey, here are my top five pieces of gear for people who are getting into this. So if you had, um, you know, you had a, a site about, you um, Baseball, it's like, hey, these are my top five products for high school baseball players. And just put it at the bottom of every unmonetized blog, blog post, if that's your target audience. Um, it's going to get you some clicks. And I don't think that having a few extra links at the bottom of a blog post is really going to do anything algorithmically to hurt your site. And where they're consolidated like that, and it feels like it's just a helpful thing at the end of your blog post, an extra helpful resource, um, users aren't going to be bothered by that. What bothers people is when all throughout the post, they feel like they're constantly getting pitched to buy something um, and it gets in the way of the content. All right, Dennis Karen asks, better three sites with 30 articles or one with 100? I generally believe um, in most cases it's one with 100. Um, it is more work to start a new site and get it to 10,000 page views than it is to take a site at 10,000 page views and get it to 50,000 page views. Um, it's a lot easier to take a site that um, is at 30,000 page views and monetize it better to make more money than it is to take a site at, uh, than it is to create a second site, get it to 30,000 page views and make just as much money. With monetization, we also find that there are sort of tiers. Um, at 10,000 page views, you can kind of reach a certain level of monetization reasonably well. At 30,000, 50,000, and 100,000 page views, we tend to find that the earnings you can get per page view on the site and per article tend to go up. They do kind of plateau at some point. If you have a site with thousands of articles, it might not do that much better than a site with 300 articles. So for every niche and for every website, there's probably kind of an optimum somewhere but that optimum is probably never going to be as low as 30. There you go. Um, more questions coming in here. In, there, in Project 24, there is advice to post two videos per week. How many shorts currently performing and publishing one per day won't cannibalize the weekly longer videos posted? Um, not letting the longer videos reach their full potential. So there is a concept on YouTube that... Um, if I post too frequently, then a video that I post will prevent a previous video from reaching its full potential. And that, that is true. Um, a video needs an opportunity to run its course with your audience. 
that's usually going to happen probably within about two days. And by that, I mean, by your audience, I mean your actual subscriber base, the people that are subscribed and get notifications from your channel. If they see that notification and they're going to watch the video from that notification, it's probably going to happen for most of them in the first day and um, for the rest of them probably within the second. Um, the rest of them, some will sort of trickle in because it'll still show as an as an unviewed notification on, within their YouTube app or something. And so they might still click on it. And we see on our videos that they'll, they'll usually, I mean, it's a spike the day they come out and then it drops off and then um, kind of reaches a plateau within a few days. So um, two videos a week, as long as they're spread out about every three-ish days, I don't think you're gonna run into an issue with cannibalizing. YouTube shorts are a little bit different. Um, the issue with shorts though, is that they're published as a normal video. And so a notification does go out to your audience. Um, the thing with shorts though, is because they're so short and they're easily recognizable as such, um, does that cause a viewer from your channel to not watch the longer video that they were anticipating already? And I don't know, we don't, I don't think we have enough data on that to be able to actually say. Um, if I had to guess, I would say probably not. Um, if anything, having shorts coming out is, is going to keep me more engaged with your channel. Um, but they're also, um, I don't know, they're so short to watch that I don't think it's going to prevent me from watching the video that came out yesterday if I haven't watched it yet. Um, I don't know that I would publish a short the same day I publish my long videos each week, though, um, if that makes sense, because you might get people that do choose one or the other. Um, but again, at this point, it's still speculation. Um, there's, there's just not, I don't think, enough to go on there yet. All right, I'm gonna take a few more here. Um, yeah, start creating videos every two days. Uh, and honestly, if you can, like if that's something you can do, you know, you could. Um, I don't know, even though it wouldn't necessarily cannibalize the previous video, um, there is such thing as just burnout. Um, if your audience is just, if you don't have anything really great to say and you're just putting something out every two days, um, then, you know, at some point they're just burned out and they get tired of you. Um, we maintain normally a weekly schedule with the occasional second video in a week. Um, and that works really well for us. But in, you know, it was mentioned in Project 24, we talk about doing two in a week. Um, when a channel's new, you've got to get more content out there. Only having 52 videos in a whole year is not enough when your channel's brand new. And so we do recommend, we do recommend, um, creating content a little faster in the beginning for sure. Um, <laughs> is your YouTube shorts worth it or is TikTok still better? We have found, um, uh, and see you Nancy, uh, I saw that uh, uh, she's gotta go work on an article, which is awesome. Um, we found that on YouTube, shorts can do really well at spreading, um, more so than just a normal video. We can make a video on a topic that should be interesting to a very wide group of people and over time, it will reach a big group of people um, and spread. But the short seems to be able to do that much more quickly. And so um, for people that are already on YouTube, are shorts worth it? I do think so. Um, is TikTok better? I don't know because I don't know really how people engage with TikTok and how that turns into um, real income for you, right? On a platform where everything is short form content like that, um, getting people to convert and come over somewhere else to buy a product, um, getting people to make an affiliate, um, you know, purchase based upon your TikTok video. Um, it's just a different, it's a different approach than, than what we do. And, um, I don't know that it would be as effective for, again, the way that we like to monetize that kind of traffic. Um, and so I don't think it's going to be effective with a YouTube short. People can subscribe to your channel and because it's something, it's a topic they're interested in and end up coming and watching your other longer videos. And, um, and that does seem to have been pretty effective. We did that on Backfire and they're not guaranteed to take off. And to be honest, we've noticed that already YouTube shorts are already taking on a little bit of that TikTok feel and um, where you're, you're being pushed videos um, from the bigger channels that are starting to do it and from celebrities. Um, more so than from small channels. In the beginning, it was a huge opportunity because little tiny channels, nobody else was doing it. 
And so their videos were spreading like crazy. Um, you know, now if you've got like Hugh Jackman making a little short about something, um, you know, people are going to watch it. And so uh, YouTube seems, it used to be that um, YouTube would always promote shorts. They would, on my short shelf, it would show, um, it would show a whole bunch of shorts that were all relevant to channels that I've um, subscribed to, even if they're not from channels I subscribe to, if that makes sense. Um, now we're finding that it's just a, becoming a little bit more virally content. Those other ones are still mixed in and we're still seeing a lot of benefit from it. But um, eventually it's going to become just as crowded as the rest of YouTube. So when we see opportunities like that, I think that just highlights how important it is to jump on top of it. I think right now it's still a cool plot. It's still a cool format. And I don't think that's a format that's going to disappear anytime soon. And I do think it will continue to adapt uh, what types of videos and whose videos are showing on that short shelf. And so um, I'm, I'm certainly not going to give up on it anytime soon. Um, but it'll be interesting to see where that goes from here. Darren Perky says, I have rescued and raised several Rottweilers. Do you think a single breed site is okay? Or should I go after something more broad like large breeds? Um, we have worked with um, a lot of people who have single breed dog websites. If that breed is um, a common breed, one that people know about and that a lot of people are likely to be interested in, um, not a really like super specific hybrid breed, um, I think that it can do very well. Generally speaking though, I do like to purchase a domain that's kind of one level further up um, in sort of the breadth of content. Um, I do think that when you, as you brand your site, as you get a logo, um, that you know having the Rottweiler there and just and even in the tagline talking about Rottweilers is a great way to start if that's where your focus is going to be and if that's where your expertise lies. And it may be that that's all the site ever is is about Rottweilers because you determine, you know what, it's a big enough breed. The thing is, you can't really know if it's going to be a big enough topic until you've created the content and been out there for a while. And so, um, and so I do like to be careful about um, niching down too far and then building like my entire branding, including the domain name around that. So I would, I would take it a step back, choose a domain name that um, doesn't necessarily say big dogs, you know, in it anywhere, but that, um, but that could be broader. We also are finding that um, because domain names are it's just getting so hard to find good ones that aren't super long, um, that finding something that's a little bit less on the nose and a little bit more brandable um, is actually working really well. It used to be that like exact match domain names um, was, was the thing for SEO. You wanted to make a site about tungsten wedding rings for men, you bought tungstenringsformen.com. That's just the way it used to be 15 years ago. Um, today, it doesn't matter so much. So, you know, when we created our pet site, we struggled and struggled and struggled um, to find a domain name that was available. And so we ended up picking Embora Pets. Embora is a Portuguese word. Um, and it really had nothing to do with anything, but it was brandable and pronounceable, and we went with it. Um, backfire. Um, the channel is something, you know, we talk about firearms and hunting and things like that, but by picking a name like Backfire, yes, it alludes to firearms, but it also is just kind of a cool, kind of a cool brand um, that we can work with. And um, it allows us now, as we start to move forward, to be able to expand beyond just firearms and be able to talk about camping gear and hiking gear and um, just the things that people that are interested in those other topics would also um, be interested in. And so, um, you know, when I say pick a domain name that's a level higher, it doesn't necessarily mean uh, that you have to pick a, a domain name that's like, oh, well, let's pick a big dog's domain name um, instead. Rather, it could be something, you know, just a little bit more fanciful or something like that. You say you own Roddy.org, so you're thinking about definitely um, – um, okay, so defining it with content. And I do, I do think that Roddy.org, I think, works. Um, and it's definitely Rottweiler-focused. Um, but could it be expanded in the future? 
even though it's like Roddy focused, Rottweiler focused, um, it probably could. I, I, domain names are mattering less and less and less. Um, content is mattering more and more, especially for SEO. So if you already own it, um, and it's nice and short. That's what I like about it. Um, I always prefer dot coms. A, a .org feels like it's an organization, not a informational site. But I, I don't know that that actually matters that much anymore either. Um, and so, yeah, sure, run with it. Um, oh, asking if there's a list of the things that are in Project 24. Um, I do think that it's somewhere we have, um, I have to figure out exactly where it is. Um, if you go to incomeschool.com slash project 24, there's a lot of information there about what's included, um, but not a complete list. Um, I think that it links to another page with more additional information that may have a video with a tour. Now, if it does, that video is probably a little bit outdated, um, but it would be accurate in the sense that it's going to have at least those things in it. Um, so there you go. <laughs> There's a start. Um, are we hiring VAs? We're currently not. We're, um, we're moving more and more toward um, working more locally with people. Um, we're finding that it's just more effective. And so we're, we're not really needing, um, needing VAs that are remote. Um, as much as I'd love to be able to work with more and more and more people, um, we're finding it's just much more effective when we can all be co-located. Um, even if we do end up working, I mean, we're online, so we certainly can work remote, but anyway. Um, what's the best way of doing this if you don't have access to footage? My blog is animals, but I don't have footage. Um, honestly, it's harder if it's not something that you're really doing um, because you don't have footage. Now, there are plenty of places where you can get stock photos and even short pieces of stock video. Um, and so if you're talking about like specifically the UCW challenge and you're like, hey, yeah, for my blog, it's working great. Um, but how do I make a YouTube video if I'm a blogger for the UCW challenge that uh, that's about pets when I don't have access to any right now? Um, and I could see that being a little bit tough. Um, I will say one thing for the challenge. Um, you can make your video um, unlisted and um, submit it. If it's private, we can't see it, but if it's unlisted, we can. Um, and if that's the case, rather than buying stock footage that you're allowed to use commercially, you could use other footage um, for the purpose of the challenge to just to show what you would do, what you're capable of. Um, if you were going to use it like actually on your YouTube channel publicly, you would need to buy the stock footage. It's very difficult. It's much harder to do YouTube um, than blogging if it's not something that you're currently living. Um, you know, it would be really, really, really hard for us to do the Backfire channel if we didn't have access to the resources that we have, um, the things that we're buying and using. And we've even created some relationships with some locals, um, um, stores and things where we're able to get a hold of gear sometimes that we don't even have to buy. Um, and that's something you could absolutely do. Um, but the more you immerse yourself in your niche, um, then the, the easier it's going to be to do YouTube. Blogging, it's a little easier to get away with. Emma, don't worry. I won't make you go on a cruise ship right now. Uh, it's going to be tough to do. <laughs> um, uh, asking again about the bracket for the UCW challenge. We're not sure about the bracket. We're still contemplating if we're going to do a bracket. Um, I think at the very end, we're going to have to. Um, but it might be more of a 32 um, and work our way down. Or it might be something more like World Cup where we do um, like pods of three or four. Um, we're just going to have to see what that looks like. Uh, we're, we just want to make sure that it's something that's going to um, fairly, uh, as we eliminate people, that it's going to do it in as fair a way as possible. Wow. Um, going for over an hour here. And I'm just ha actually having a lot of fun. Um, so there you go. Um, <laughs> I will go ahead and, um, I'll just take one more question. Um, so let me look for something that will be really good to end this. Um, you know what, maybe I'll take a couple cause there's a couple of, uh, UCW type, um, questions coming in. And so I'll take a few here. Prizes for the runners up. We haven't figured out yet. I'd like to do something. We have some ideas. 
Um, because honestly, like there are so many of you guys, like you guys are just content warriors. It's just awesome what you guys are doing. Um, and so that's awesome. Um, the future of blogs versus YouTube. That's a nice big question. Um, honestly, video is amazing. It's uh, certainly growing in popularity. People are coming to YouTube for everything from their entertainment, like leaving TV and cable for YouTube, um, also for information. And so video is becoming more and more prominent, but I don't think blogs are going away anytime soon. I don't think that bloggers who are doing a good job are going to notice a significant decline for some time, quite some time. I do, I do recognize the, the issues we face. I recognize that uh, Google is keeping more traffic for themselves. Um, I think we can continue to play that game for several years to come. I don't think it's in Google's best interest to eliminate us anytime soon. Somebody has to provide the information. Um, but I do think that there are some niches um, and some types of content that will become obsolete in the future. Um, I, what exactly those are, I, I don't know. I have some ideas of what that might be. Um, you know, anything where it's like, you know what, the information for this is pretty simple and um, publicly available um, in a digital form. You know, in that case, like Google's just gonna give it to us like they've done with weather. Like if you had a blog 10 years ago that was like, hey, here's what the upcoming weather is going to be in, you know, throughout Idaho. You could actually probably have had that as a blog 20 years ago. Um, and you could have looked at the newspapers and watched the news and followed certain, um, you know, meteorologists and stuff and presented that information. That doesn't work today, obviously, right? And I think that type of content where we're taking information that's readily available in a digital format um, and we're just pulling it together and putting it in blog form. Um, it's not going to do well for organic um, search in the future. Um, I've had a couple questions. Where's Jim today? Jim is Jim is driving. He's uh, traveling a little bit. Um, he's having some trouble with his truck, so he was out getting it fixed and then taking a trip um, to go be with uh, some family. So that's where he's at today. Jim is super involved in this challenge. He's been doing a lot of judging, um, and we've been just meeting a ton um here in the office and stuff so um it's been it's just been a blast but um anyway okay uh how do we know if a niche is competitive i know you've asked that question like two dozen times so um it's not totally cut and dry but frankly when we're looking into a niche we do dozens of google searches um and we don't just start with the high level stuff we um we 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 try to dive in deep on the types of questions people probably have. Um, we do look at, we, we call it the inverted period pyramid, so the wide parts at the top, but we look at the inverted pyramid and we think about what are the types of questions in, in this niche that the largest number of people are gonna have, which is often beginners in that niche. Um, experts have very specific questions, but there are very few people asking those. Um, those are the high search volume questions and we just start Googling those and see what the competition looks like. and that's what it is. If we can, if we can, in a matter of, you know, half an hour, identify even, you know, five or 10 pretty good cracks that they're just gaps in the information that's available. It's a really good indication that we're going to be, be able to identify several dozen more. And that's going to be enough for us to build enough authority to be able to now start competing for uh, some of the topics where there are other people writing about it, but we just will do a better job and we'll build some authority. Who scores the challenges? Um, the blogging challenges are predominantly scored by uh, me, Jim, and Nathan. Um, Nathan, if you guys don't see him a ton on this channel, Nathan is awesome. He's over in the other room. Um, Nathan runs the Creator Studio. Nathan managed the first version of the Creator Studio um, as a college student, and we uh, sniped him up and brought him over here. He's been working um, hand in hand with me and Jim for a couple of years now and um, is now running the creator studio doing more search analysis than almost anybody um, in the world is probably doing um, running several teams of writers and um, just doing a fantastic job. So um, anyway, Nathan knows when it comes to blogging, he 
knows what Jim and I know. So he's helping us judge those. Um, Jim and I are also helping with some of the YouTube. Um, Nate is judging a lot of the YouTube. Anna has been judging if, uh, the YouTube as well. And she's been doing some of the blogging. She's kind of been doing an awesome job. She's, um, she's, doing a lot, she's doing a lot of blogging. She's doing a lot of YouTube. And so she's kind of been more across the board. Uh, I don't think Nate's been as involved with the blogging, but um, mostly on the blogging side, me, Jim, and Nathan. And on the YouTube side, me, Jim, and Nate. Uh, I hope that's not confusing. <laughs> what do we think about answer the public's tool? Is it worth it? Um, uh, by is it worth it? Um, I don't think it costs anything. Um, the only version of it I've used has been free. Um, I do think like a lot of other tools. Um, so, hey, thanks, Better Shutter. I appreciate that. Um, we all got to stop procrastinating. <laughs> um, no, um, I think that those kind of tools where you kind of, you put in a keyword or some keywords and it spits out a whole bunch of um, ideas. I think they have some value um, some real value, especially when you get stuck, um, that helping you identify the types of things that people are looking for. It doesn't give you in, any indication um, of how good that topic is or that question would be to answer in a blog post. I would not use any tools like that um, as, a, as a, like the tool said, I should write this blog post. The tool said, this is a question um, that needs to be answered and I will go answer it. Um, in a blog post, but I do like to use those as ideas. I do like to use them as a starting point to um, uh, um, to go down different paths and brainstorm. Um, and from there, doing some competition analysis and again, using the gray matter between my ears, I'm able to figure out some good topics. So yeah, absolutely, they're great. Any of those tools are, are great for just identifying ideas. Question about what is this frame? Um, there's two of these. These are both um, flies, like fishing flies. Um, and they were actually given to me by um, a member of Project 24 and a YouTube subscriber who, um, who had those from a fly tying club from years and years ago and just knew that I was into it. And so um, we sent them over. I thought that was just awesome. So um, anyway, so they're on my wall. Um, let's see. Leave it on a controversial note. What do you think of Neil Patel, <laughs> No Man's Planet? Um, you know what? When it comes to a lot of the other people um, that are teaching SEO, um, that are teaching blogging, that are teaching YouTube, we only follow them to the extent that we need to to keep up with what's just going on in the industry. I don't watch almost any of his videos. Um, frankly, I don't have time to. I'm too busy testing stuff myself. And so, um, you know, I, I can't really say I, you know, it's easy to tease and kind of make fun. Uh, uh, I'm sure people absolutely could do that about me. Um, I've certainly seen YouTube videos where people uh, criticize our methods and stuff. Um, I think Neil has a lot of experience in certain aspects of SEO. And I think that he, uh, he knows what he's talking about in a lot of things. I also think if you're asking for honesty, I think that um, most of his videos um, the tips are highly repetitive and um, sometimes mm, like surface deep and not super actionable, um, a little bit philosophical. I think that a lot, of, um, a lot of big people on YouTube in most industries are big because they were first. Um, that said, he has some amazing advice um, uh, in you know, a lot of his videos, really, really good advice. So I'm, I'm not going to overly criticize. Um, I do things differently. Um, I don't watch most of his videos, so I can't say he's great or he's bad. Um, but what I do watch, there's some really good stuff in there. And there's a lot of stuff in there that I feel like is eh, not all that glad I watched it. So there you go. Akabato updates. So more news question. Um, Akabato has had some updates recently. Um, some of the things that I'm most focused on for kind of the next round is Core Web Vitals. I want to make sure that Akabato is just handling things to be able to score really well um, and not cause any sort of negative impact um, from an SEO standpoint because of you know page loading. Um, beyond that, we really, really want to provide some new designs. Um, so there's the current, there's kind of one layout for the home page. You can create 
in Akabato, you can create a custom page. If you have a custom page builder or even just want to use Gutenberg, you can create, um, you know, any sort of page. Like you can use Akabato with like Divi page builder and have just an awesome homepage. But we want Akabato to be able to be complete. So we're adding, I think it was either four or five different, totally different layout skins um, for what like the homepage and just the general feel of the site would look like, how the sidebar would look and work, everything. Um, and just the overall theme of the site, um, as well as some custom pages for things like a sales page. We want to have that more built in so that you can do that without necessarily having to go buy an external page builder. If you have another page builder, like um, we have a lifetime license for Divi. Um, I like their page builder. It's really easy to use. Not lightning fast though, um, but it's really easy to use. Um, you can you can build custom pages within Akabata with that and already do all of those things, but I'm, I'm excited for that. I'm actually really excited for that. It's gonna be a little bit before the designs are ready. Um, the designs are done, but it's gonna be a little bit before the development's ready because so many things we're doing, including one other project. Um, this affiliate plugin we've been working on is gonna be awesome. We're close to getting back um, kind of a first version of it, but it's going to be a while before it's like ready for the public. But um, yeah, it's, it's going to be super cool what it's going to do to help you monetize your site um, for affiliate as well as just for everything. So um, yeah. What software are we using to host the courses on our website? I, I'm just going to, I'm just still going guys. Um, <laughs> um, the courses are run through L, um, Learn Dash is the LMS software, the learning management system. Um, so that's what handles like creating courses, lessons, and that whole structure. Now we have had a custom theme built around that for Project 24. Um, and, you know, Learn Dash is capable of being built out that way, but sort of the default look is kind of meh, but it's capable. Um, it's more about just the learning management system. Um, to handle the... Uh, Access, we're using MemberPress, but again, we've had some custom development done around that. MemberPress is like 90% of the way there. Um, and we keep asking for like these couple of features that would just, that would just make us love them. And they're like, eh, okay, maybe someday. And we get very, very, very few feature updates from MemberPress. So we use it, um, it's working really well for us. Um, Member mouse is great too, and a little bit simpler to use and set up. I think member press might be a little more capable than member mouse, but a little bit more tough to set up. Anyway, when will the Akabato update happen? I wish I could give you a date. Um, it, uh, I don't know. Every time we give a date with development projects, it ends up being a struggle. Our development work is being, we're working with developers, but they're not in-house employees. Um, and so, uh, it's it that's something that we'd like to improve upon. We'd like we want to have an in-house um, developer who's just working on these projects full time. Um, I think we can move faster that way. But right now um, we're working really really well with uh, with another local company here um, that is able to come meet with us. And because of that, we don't have total control <laughs> over how quickly things happen. I'd love to be able to turn things around really 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 quick. Um, and yes, Emma, like when people ask me about my competitors, it's like what am I supposed to say? Right. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to, I'm not going to really bad mouth somebody, especially when I think they're, they're doing what they think is best and they're doing a, a good job. Um, they're going to do things different than I like, and they're going to say things that I disagree with sometimes. And that's just that. Um, so there you go. Um, and no man's planet. You say you're a developer. Hey, if you want to move to, to Idaho, we we want somebody in house. And so uh, if you do, there may actually be a job listing posted um, that you can search for on our website uh, for a WordPress developer with experience. So there you go. Um, people talking about Neil now, see this is why I don't do this. Um, yeah, his target audience is totally different. And so where our differences of, of uh, approach come in is because we're talking to independent bloggers and some of the things that he says aren't applicable, but people watching him don't necessarily know that, which is why in the past, uh, we've had to clarify a few things in <laughs> for our audience um, because there are people who watch both. And um, I do think that if an independent blogger followed all of his advice, sometimes they'd be um, misled. 
Not, I think, because he wants them to. Um, and I don't know who Craig Campbell is. Um, there you go. That just shows to show that I'm just not following, um, not following everybody. Uh, anyway, so there we go. <laughs> uh, any sites for sale? Not right now, but soon. Um, and last time, last time we posted a site for sale, we announced it. Uh, we announced it in Project 24. We announced it here on, on YouTube. And we set, this is just kind of a funny story. We set the, um, uh, we set it so that it only could be bought one time. Um, so the person that was going to buy it, instead of applying like they've done in the past, they just had to put down a deposit and then it was reserved. And, um, and so we put down like a thousand dollar deposit, right? And somebody had to make that payment and it was set to only allow that to happen one time. 17 people got through. Um, <laughs> yeah, 17 people bought it within a short enough period of time that the computer couldn't tell. Um, it definitely knew which one came in first, but they were all happening concurrently. And so they all got through. And next thing you knew, we were refunding 16 people who thought they had won the site uh, and hadn't. So next time around, we will be giving a little bit of a heads up at some point, um, but it's mostly just going to be we're not going to give an exact day, an exact time. Um, we're just going to kind of post them for sale as they come in on incomeschool.com slash garage sale, I think. And it's going to be first come, first serve. Um, and so if you're looking to buy a site, the best thing I can tell you is to you know, just come back often starting probably early February, mid-February. Just come back often and you may be the lucky person who finds one. Um, I wish we could create websites for everybody that wants to buy one. Um, it's <laughs> currently not feasible. Um, okay. Let's see. Um, so this is a good question. Somebody launched a business about eBooks and they're wondering, do they need to make videos and do blog as a part promotion? Um, and of course I'm going to say you should, <laughs> that's what we do. We, uh, create blogs, we make YouTube channels, we make videos um, to drive traffic, to be able to market anything. Um, sometimes that's marketing our own products. And a lot of times it's marketing other people's products, um, through advertisements and affiliates. But basically at the heart of it, we are marketers. We gather an audience of people together. If you have a business about a specific topic, a great way to market that business is by driving free organic traffic, um, to your content. And to do that, you need content. Um, so if you have a business about eBooks, um, Maybe if it's about creating eBooks, how to create and sell an eBook, um, then absolutely you would want to create content about creating and selling eBooks, how much you can make by selling eBooks. There's so many topics you want to cover that as people search for those things, they come, they read your content, and then um, you know somewhere along the way you say, by the way, we have this entire guide or whatever for how to create um, an eBook, how to launch it, and how to make it the most money with it. Um, it's a great way to market your product and way cheaper than paying for ads or trying to promote it through other ways. So I, that's why I love, I love organic marketing. Um, cause that's pretty much what we do. Okay. Is our free stock images bad for SEO? My concern with free stock images is that it is really hard to know if you're actually legally allowed to use them. Um, a lot of times they'll show up as royalty free or whatever. Um, but the people who posted them there who say they're the original creator are not necessarily. And we see that happen all the time. And you can get yourself in trouble by using, uh, you know, something that you actually didn't have the rights to use. That happens almost never with paid stock photos. Although we just came across this. Um, we have used an image that we paid for the stock image. Um, and it was uh, an, an image that we use repeatedly um, in thumbnails um, on one of our channels. Um, and we found out completely without knowing it that um, this image is basically almost a carbon copy of like a branded logo that a Canadian company uses. We've never seen it before because we're not in Canada, but it's all over their marketing it's close enough that it's a, it would be a trademark violation like if we weren't careful. And so we have to, um, even that one, like now, even though we paid for it, technically the original, I mean, it's part of their logo. 
And so we're, we're just going to, we're going to change it. That happens very rarely with paid stock photos. Um, it happens a lot with free stock photos. Um, Google images with commercial usage rights. That's kind of what I'm talking about that. And some of the other places where you can get free ones. Um, it, the people who, who say I'm the original creator and even like, um, you know, they, anyway, they say they're the original creator. They even like check a box saying I certify I'm the original creator. They're not necessarily. So, um, you know, you gotta be really careful with that. And so that's why we choose, we pay for them. Um, that way we definitely have a paid license for it. And so even if somebody comes after us, we can, we can say, Oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't know we have a paid license for it from this agency. And then they're going to be mad at the agency way more than they're mad at us. So there you go. Um, thoughts on people hiring native content writers for more rates and Indians for less when they provide the same quality. Is that racist? Wow. Uh, uh, now I'm getting into um, the racism question here. The thing with blogging um, with any writing is that a native, um, a native speaker and not just um, somebody who speaks that language, but who speaks it like locals, right? So many people in India speak English like all the time. That's like their normal language um, or one that they speak regularly, right? But the some of the terms that you use are gonna be different. Um, and so I do, there, there, there are a couple things going on there. One is um, it may seem like the same quality, but if it, if one of them feels like it was written by, like it was written by a native, right? Whether if I'm in the UK, it sounds like it was written by somebody there. Um, and yeah, exactly. Americans can't say niche, um, can they? Yes, we, we can say niche, but why should we? It's niche. Um, <laughs> no. Um, and so there's that, right? So there is benefit in hiring somebody who is very familiar with, with the, not just the language, but also just the terminology and vernacular. Um, the other issue though, is the marketplace. So if you're somebody who's gonna be really particular, I want someone who can write perfectly in American English. So I'm going to hire an American. Americans are gonna demand more income for the work that they do. Um, and they can because they can, if they don't write your article, they can go get a job down the street flipping burgers for $15 an hour if they live in certain places. Um, and so why should they take such a small amount to write an article? The market is very different in India. Cost of living is very different in India. And so there are plenty of writers in India who are willing to work for a lower rate. And so this is, I mean, this is basic economics, but if I, if I come across a, a several writers in India and I'm not particular about having perfect local terminology. I just want someone who's a good English writer who's gonna make quality content. And one says, no, I wanna be paid as much as an American. And the other says, hey, I'll take whatever you give me because for me, what you can pay is a living, is a living wage for me. You know, I'm, I'm gonna be inclined to pay the person that charges me the least. That's not racist, that's, that's like how we do things. Um, we, we don't pay more for something if we can pay less and get the same thing. Um, so anyway, that's why to me, it's not that it's, uh, it's not that it's racist. It's, it's economics and it's normal human psychology. And sometimes there is a reason to pay more to an American writer. There are many services where Americans say it's not worth paying an American and they absolutely outsource them to countries like India because, it doesn't need to be an American and Americans are pretty demanding about how much they want to get paid for stuff. And so there you go. Um, there you go. <laughs> oh man. Um, are Western countries still higher RPMs? Well, yes, they are. Um, uh, once again, because uh, Western countries, um, Western European countries, um, North American countries, because, um, you know, people, their incomes, and well, cost of living too, but overall just um, the incomes are, are higher in general, right? And we spend more money on stuff. Um, there are plenty of places in the world where incomes are high, but people are just a little bit less uh, um, vain maybe <laughs> as we are. They buy less stuff. And because we buy so much stuff and spend so much money, um, an American market is 
who advertisers want to advertise to. And so again, I, RPMs are driven by the, who the audience is, both where they come from, but also um, a lot of it's contextual too. If the topics of your content are, are bringing in certain types of people, um, people that typically have more money because the content of the blog is geared toward people who are homeowners or executives or whatever, then that's a target audience that is more likely to buy stuff. And so advertisers are naturally going to want to have their ads featured there and are going to be willing to pay more for that. Um, wow, I'm, I could probably go on for hours, guys. Um, you guys, These questions will never stop. Um, oh, okay. If the site gets hit by a Google update, should you wait a year before making changes? Or you can update uh, after the post is a year old. We like to wait till the post is a year old to make changes simply because we want to make sure that it's been given ample time to rank where it's going to rank, okay? Um, that's why we don't make major updates too soon on a blog post. If you're constantly changing it, then co Google's constantly having to re-index it and retest it. If Google makes a major update and it hits your site um, and you see a dramatic change in certain blog posts, I would give it a few weeks because oftentimes it takes a while for that to settle. And sometimes people recover some of that traffic very quickly. Um, but I think after a few weeks, even if your content is nine months old and it was going really well and now all of a sudden it got slammed, um, I might try to look for why. I might try to understand why and go ahead and make the updates now because it's not likely to just turn around on its own. Um, so there you go. Um, Okay, guys, uh, I said like one more question like half an hour ago, but I just keep going. Um, I have seen this issue, pages not showing in site colon search um, or Google hiding it from the SERP. Um, there have been some issues around indexing lately. Um, we have, uh, and just this particular thing where people do a, a site colon search um, and their content's not appearing, um, that's kind of a, it's a recent issue. Um, that's, that's on Google side. Um, I don't know if they're just kind of hiding that, um, within that feature, or if there is just an issue with indexing right now. Um, they say, I heard the other day they said, oh, it's fixed. But, um, anyway, uh, I don't exactly know what to say there. I don't think there's a quick workaround. Uh, if you're concerned about indexing, you know, submit a sitemap to, um, search console, um, and, but just let Google do its job. It'll, um, it'll work. Um, let's see. Do we have a schedule for our lives? You know what? I'm going to kind of end on this one. I'm, I, that might be true. That might not. Um, but do we have a schedule for your lives? Um, oh, okay. Two, integrating site with Azoic, and then I'll come back to our lives. Um, I don't want to talk about the best content mill. Um, simply because we haven't tried them all. Um, there are some well-known content mills out there that we made a video about about a year ago. Um, probably wouldn't use any of them anymore because there's better alternatives. There are several members of Project 24 who are writing articles and having um, their writers write articles much more like how we would. Um, and I think they're doing a good job. Um, they all have slightly different pricing and slightly different structures and stuff. And um, Without doing a thorough test, uh, I don't necessarily want to make one solid recommendation. Um, anyway, integrating your site with Azoic. Azoic right now is working on, um, uh, they're working on their integration, their rollout. Um, I've noticed and given them the feedback on this that um, when you sign up for Azoic and you get approved, uh, yes, they kind of have a one, two, three, four, five step approach but then they have like all these other tools and things and you're not sure what you need to do and what things are just added features. And um, it can, they have so much to offer that it can be overwhelming. Um, they are, they have been hard at work on creating more of an onboarding um, to the point of they've like made a little class that you can take to walk you through step-by-step -step all of the different things that you need to do to get fully integrated and showing you what the other features are and how you could use them if you wanted to. Um, I'm excited to see how that works. Um, they, they are rolling some things out for members of Project 24 right now um, for that onboarding process to make it easier 
uh, and make it cleaner. Um, so for members of Project 24, there is kind of a special process um, for um, kind of the general public. I don't know um, for sure how that process gets implemented um, across the board for them. So I, I do think they still have kind of the class that you can take, um, which I think is really beneficial. Back to the schedule. Um, you know, uh, week by week, day by day, we've tried over and over and over again to have um, like a weekly schedule that we're going to follow every week and we keep breaking it. Um, <laughs> in general, though, what we do like to do is um, for our business and for our lives is at any point in time, we have specific objectives that we're working on. Now, it's not quite the same as like what a lot of corporations will talk about with objectives. It's, it's very, very tangible, um, very action oriented, very specific. And um, we as a team all work together towards certain objectives. I in my life am doing the same thing. And they're time bound um, and they're milestone specific. So like I, at this point, I need to be here on this in order to achieve my objective. Um, and, uh, you know, we do that. Absolutely. Um, I don't have like a five-year plan. Um, so talking about scheduling our lives, um, because frankly, in this business, it's a little bit hard to see a year ahead. Um, we have a pretty good idea at this point, what we're going to be working on for the next couple of years. Um, because we've kind of got to that point. Um, but you know, I, I don't have career wise, like a five-year plan. I I'm doing this. I'm going to keep doing this. Um, I love doing this. And, um, but what exactly that looks like five years from now, I have no idea. Um, in terms of a, again, a day-to-day -day, week to week, month to month schedule. Um, I don't, I don't live by a rigid schedule. Jim certainly doesn't either. Um, I do practice. I have had to learn how to practice really good work-life balance though. Um, I have a tendency when I care about the work I'm doing for it to be very pervasive throughout my thoughts. Like I go home in the evening and I'm having a hard time, um, <laughs> like letting my mind relax and just be present. And I've spent a lot of, I've had a lot of effort in the last year to, to do that, um, for my family. And so as content creators, and as a lot of you, um, still like working a job and stuff, it can be hard. Um, there can be a lot of work to do. And for the last couple of weeks, I have spent some time in the evenings um, judging UCW entries. Um, and, and that has eaten into the time. And my family understands that and gives that to me sometimes, which is a nice gift. But um, generally speaking, I have worked really hard so that when my day ends, which it will here pretty shortly, I need to run some errands on my way home. Um, when my day ends at work, um, I'm, I've been trying really hard to let it be done. Um, and I think that's been really valuable. And if I need to do additional work, I set aside designated time. And within that time I go do it. Um, but outside of that time, it's been important for me to be present. I know Jim, um, is also someone whose mind is always racing. He's always like, you know, wanting to just, I mean, that guy is one of the best researchers I've ever, I've ever met. He is constantly listening to something to learn something new. Um, and so, but he also sets aside time and his family does it very different than mine. So that's why I'm being a little bit um, cagey with the details. His family does it very different than mine, the way they spend time together. But when it's family time, even for him, it's still family time. And he's just off. I, I you can't get a hold of him practically. Um, and so I think that's important. Um, even when we have to work our tails off, uh, to, <laughs> to, um, to get work done. And, and it's hard, um, when you're doing this and you're still working, uh, a normal job or you have other obligations, you have family and other things going on in your life. It's hard. Um, and sometimes you do have to eat into time that you would otherwise be sleeping, uh, watching TV, relaxing, or doing the other things that you used to do to kind of wind down. Um, and now you're eating into that to create content. Um, I think the important thing is that we recognize that when we have to do those kinds of things, um, that maybe there's a finite timeline associated with that so that we have a light at the end of the tunnel, at which point we know we're going to be able to come back um, to having more of that family time or that personal time or that downtime. Um, if we have to do that and we have to do the grind, but we can't see a future where we aren't going to have to, um, that's, I think, where... Um, you can really start to struggle with mental health and, and uh, emotional 
um, issues and anxiety related to that. And I've certainly been through my share of that too. So um, anyway, I love talking to you guys. This has been a blast. Um, I think my laptop battery is going to die here soon. And, um, and I know that was a long answer, um, and a little bit of a deep answer too, but um, it's just such a blast. I love getting to interact with you guys. The Ultimate Content Warrior Challenge has been one of the best opportunities that we've had as of yet to be able to have a little bit of a one-on-one -on -one interaction, but with a much bigger group of people than we're normally able to do. So thank you all for, for participating in this live. I went um, probably about an hour longer than I thought I would, but it's been a blast. So we'll see you guys next time. Um, and thanks for tuning in. See you guys.